If a demonic Rubik's Cube was bent on dragging you and your friends off to a plane of eternal suffering, what would you do? Mr. Voigt had it all. Power, wealth, and unlimited access to all of life's most lurid temptations. But it was never enough. Eventually, his ceaseless pursuit of corporeal bliss led him into an arrangement with dark forces beyond our realm. By sacrificing others to a mysterious puzzle box, he would be granted a gift of sensation greater than any found on Earth. However, perception is a double-edged sword, and now he seeks a new set of victims to undo the curse of his own making. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Cenobites in Hellraiser. While out on another hedonistic romp at the Pleasure Palace, American gigolo and group hug enthusiast Joey finds himself growing bored of the smorgasbord of debauchery laid out before him. Instead, what he truly lusts after are answers surrounding the enigmatic benefactor behind all the festivities. His curiosity catches the eye of a mysterious older woman, Serena, who claims the reclusive billionaire would almost certainly love to meet him, instructing the young man to find her at the end of a nearby hallway in 10 minutes. Yeah. Call me paranoid, but if Mr. Voigt was so keen on meeting every last joy toy that darkened his doorway, people would probably know a lot more about him. Might want to try and find someone lucid enough to come along in case things get weird or weirder. After all, she didn't say anything about us coming alone, and given the general vibe of this place, she can hardly blame us for thinking it's a the more the merrier type situation. Joey arrives at the meeting place as directed, but there's no sign of Serena anywhere. Just a bunch of weird rich people crap locked away under glass display cases. That is, except for the centerpiece. Sure, just go ahead and wrap your greasy little meat claws all over it. Nothing people like more than random street urchins manhandling their priceless artifacts. Not to mention the fact that this thing looks like Megatron's personal stress reliever. Should probably put it back before you start leaking in places you'd rather not talk about. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over. There's millions of champion combinations and tactics to stomp bosses, PvP arena new basement dwellers in dungeon runs, and campaign NPCs with. Spooky season is here, so main the best Halloween champs like Miscreated Monster, Frankenstein's Chad Brother, Gerda Bogbrew, None Can Withstand the Sight Nor Stench, Theodore the Savant, the Extra-Dimensional Cenobite. Raid's running a trick-or-treat promotion Halloween between October 15th and November 5th, where you can win real-life and in-game prizes, including $1,000 worth of Amazon gift cards, and some of the best epic and legendary Halloween champions and raid. Only new players can win a prize. Grab your raid player ID, head to trickortreat.playerium.com, spin the wheel, and get your prize. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level your strongest champion to level 50. Click my link or scan my QR code and you'll get bonuses worth $30. A free epic champion, Ina, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard. All this treasure is here. Thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Suddenly, the host with the most appears from a nearby staircase to address his guest's interest in the strange device, explaining it to be a one-of-a-kind puzzle on the verge of completion, before encouraging him to try and solve it. If I solve it, do I get a prize? I do. Oh, okay, nothing to read into there. If you were recruited from Chippendales to work a party at 001 Cemetery Lane only to get cougar catfished into solving an elemental stone puzzle for Phil Dumpy's evil twin, you need to GTFO immediately. You were hired for one thing and one thing only, and it's definitely not Nicholas caging some long lost MacGuffin. Besides, if this thing is so close to being finished that any idiot off the streets could do it, why wouldn't he have already done it himself? It's gotta be some kind of trap. I mean, hell, that prize he was talking about is probably your unconscious body once this thing sprays you in the face with form. And that means you're probably not getting paid for whatever happens next. Undeterred by the small mountain of red flags piling up all around him, Joey continues twisting and turning the medieval bop it until only one logical move remains. However, his intrigue turns to horror when the final step forces a small blade through the palm of his hand. And the fun doesn't stop there. Mr. Voigt flips a switch on a nearby column, sealing the exit before his pawn can escape. Yeah, it's about this time you start to realize you're about to have a very 
bad day. But, <laughs> dude, you don't know the half of it. Just then, a half dozen hooked chains descend on the wounded man from every direction, ripping into his flesh and hoisting him up in the air. As Joey screams out in agony, Void places the object back on his pedestal and looks up through the skylight, beseeching some unknown entity to grant him an audience with what he calls the Leviathan. Elsewhere in the city, Riley's laid on the rent once again, and this time her brother's no longer willing to pick up the slack on her behalf. Fortunately, her chronic enabler boyfriend, Trevor, knows just how she can scare up some quick cash. All they have to do is raid an old shipping container housed in some rich randos abandoned storage unit and swipe whatever's inside. And if that doesn't sound easy enough, turns out he already has the access code from his job at Planet Express. Judging by the contents of that coffee table, I'd say these two probably aren't in the state of mind to think things through. But if I were Riley, I'd start asking some questions to make sure he wouldn't be better off driving for Grubhub. For starters, I highly doubt Trevor was dropping sh off at this place in the dead of night. So does he have any idea whether there might be some kind of watchman or security detail we have to look out for? Second, do enough people have this code to ensure he won't be immediately implicated should the owner ever come around to collect his stuff? It's one thing if every r &L guy in the country has it, but if it's literally just him and his boss, we might as well forget it. That night, Bonnie and Clyde pull up in Trevor's creeper van and hop the fence into the complex. Sure, don't even bother covering your faces or anything. I'm sure they like being robbed. Not to mention the fact that you literally parked right outside. Better hope that pile is stolen or you'll both be wearing orange by the end of the week. Upon keying into the warehouse and opening up the container, the pair find nothing but a single small safe positioned right in the middle of the floor. How convenient. Yeah, go ahead and shoulder punch each other like you just hit the jackpot. Does it not occur to either of you how suspicious this is? No way it was transported like this. That safe would be bouncing off the wall every time they hit a pothole. I'm not saying it's got the monkey paws in there, but it certainly seems like whoever put this thing here was hoping someone like us would try and open it. Well, except for the fact that neither of us have the combination. But that's what sledgehammers are for, right? Wrong. Beating on this thing is gonna make one a racket, especially echoing around inside a metal shipping container. And the last thing we need is some rent -a cop hearing the commotion and rolling on us like we're totally cornered. The lockbox looks pretty solid, but it doesn't appear to be bolted down, so the two of us might be able to carry it back to the van to work on it later. If not, might be a better idea to bag it for now and come back later once we have some sort of cutting tools. Sure, that's still gonna make plenty of noise, but at least it's bound to go faster than taking turns wailing on it all night. After God knows how many smacks with the hammer, the door finally gives way, revealing a small wooden box. Inside, they find an even smaller box, except this one's pretty blinged out. Oh, and would you look at that? It's got dried blood all around it. How fun. Well, at least it's probably worth something. I'll see if I can find some kind of appraiser. We'll split whatever cash we can get from it. Let me just get this straight. You're gonna find an appraiser for a billionaire's one-of-one, one, multi-million dollar jack-in-the-box. Yeah, no way that'll ever be traced back to you. While you're at it, might as well swing by Rick's pawn shop and see if he's got any buddies that specialize in unholy instruments of unspeakable torment. If you're lucky, he might even offer you like $50 for it. Sometime later, Riley's raucous return to her apartment pulls her brother out of bed, who immediately calls out the smell of celebration on her breath. And given she's fresh out of rehab for this sort of thing, Matt decides this is a hill he's ready to die on. The resulting row ends with Big Brother giving her the boot, prompting her to pack her junk and make for her car. Yeah, great idea taking out your frustrations by wailing on your new home. That's really gonna up the resale value once you decide to downsize to a refrigerator box under the overpass. However, instead of just sleeping it off in the back seat and begging your brother for forgiveness in the morning, Riley decides that now would be a perfect time for getting spun in the kitty park and ponder the mysterious soul cue. Cause what's the harm in waving around your visibly valuable thingamajig while you're too geeked out to defend yourself? Not that sobriety would give her that much more of a chance when Sturdy Mike and the boy shows up. Hang on, you're not gonna put your finger in that thing, are you? Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. I thought for sure you'd be coming out of there like Tom Berenger. This thing looks like something used to punish public urinators back in the Middle Ages. Eventually, Max Park dials in the correct combination. However, unlike poor Joey, she manages to dodge the cheese knife at the last second. Hang on, did you see that? That blade was meant for you. If not you, bring us another. You see, children, that's why you say no to 
systems. Otherwise, how will you know whether you're being extorted by Hot Topic employees or just staring at the back of your hand? Back at the apartment, Matt awakens from a nightmare and decides to track Riley down so he can walk back the eviction. Upon reaching her car, he sees her lying unconscious in the merry-go-round and rushes to her aid. In a desperate attempt to wake her up, Matt rips the cube from her hands, failing to notice the razor-sharp blade sticking out of it and slicing himself to the bone in the process. Something tells me that washing that off in a filthy bathroom sink is not gonna cut it. Besides, in Riley's current state, we shouldn't leave her side until the paramedics show up to dose her with the Narcan. I would place her on her side in the recovery position and call 911 immediately, and then take off my shirt and wrap it tightly around the injured hand. Once help arrives to get Riley sorted out, we should call Colin to have him drive us to the hospital. I mean, sure, the cut is bad, but it's not thousand plus dollar ambulance ride bad. Suddenly, things start getting kind of wacky as the cube begins to adjust itself on its own. Whether it's the sudden blood loss or some kind of poison on the blade, something has got young Matt seeing 3D. You know things aren't looking good when your reflection stops following your movements. But wait, it gets even weirder. Something tells me that won't take you to Hogwarts. Just then, the sound of her brother screaming snaps Riley back to reality, but upon rushing into the bathroom to investigate, it seems he's vanished into thin air. All right, well, it's not like anyone would arrive at the conclusion that he got swallowed up by the wall, but he obviously didn't walk back out in front of us. Of course, given we're still loopier than a bowl of Cheerios, how can we be certain he was even here in the first place? One thing's for sure, with a cut like that, you'd expect at least some kind of blood trail. Should probably try blowing up both him and his boyfriend on the phone in case this whole thing was just some kind of fever dream. Having gotten nowhere with the police, Riley heads back to Trevor's house to drown out the pangs of culpability over her brother's disappearance. There, the two of them try to work through what happened the night before, including her hallucinations. According to Miss Poppins, she had only taken her usual dose, and it's never given her that kind of reaction. Not to mention the fact that she's still periodically seeing things despite being totally sober. As for the GameCube, you still have that thing? You told the others you saw me <laughs> Goddamn GameCube. You told the others you saw Matt cut himself on it. Why wouldn't you immediately give it to the cops so they'd at least have a sample of his DNA to work with? Nah, screw that. Better to just run off for some day play at your boyfriend's house instead of doing f all to help the investigation. I'm sure it's what Big Bro would have wanted. Oh, and now she's playing with it again. You do remember when that tiny knife thing shot out of it, right? You know, around the time your brother got disappeared. Why on earth would you even be holding it right now? Especially with bare hands. Should find an old ammo can or something to keep it in until you figure out which volcano it needs to be thrown into. Here, you try. Fuck no. First smart move he's made to date. Hey, this thing Jimmy Hoffa to my older brother and is making me hallucinate monsters. You want to take a crack at it? How about you get the fuck right out of my house? Seriously, bro, time to dust off the dating profile. You can do a lot better than this. But Riley's brilliant ideas don't stop there. Now she wants to track down the guy she stole this thing from so she can ask him about it. Tell me, what kind of person do you think would own something like this? Do you think they're the type that would just laugh it off and then teach you a lesson about the power of friendship? Or do you think they would drop you through a hole in the floor and force you to duke it out with a rancor for their own sick amusement? After a bit of off-screen salute, Thing. The couple arrives at the hospice facility where they find Serena rotting away from the inside out. Questioning her about the warehouse eventually reaches a dead end. So Riley goes for the nuclear option and plops the no-no square down on the table. Realizing it's not in its starting configuration, Serena asks who screwed the pooch before correctly assuming Riley's brother got ghosted after catching the poke. She then attempts to save them from themselves by snatching it away and putting it on airplane mode. But our hero still feels the need to get other people killed solving your problems. Back! No! Ah! And scratch another one for Riley. Man, in the web of the hands, no less. It's bad enough a bunch of freakazoids are gonna drag her off to the upside down later, but now she has to walk around with that all day. That said, why on earth would anyone who knows what this thing is go anywhere near it? She should have told them to take their steampunk marital aid and pound sand. All right, let's unpack this for a second. The only way Serena would know that Matt disappeared after touching the thing is if she's seen it go down before. And since BuzzFeed hasn't published any listicles on 10 ways to cope 
cope with being swallowed alive by a tesseract, I'm guessing it was a one-way trip for those involved as well. Sorry, Charlie, I think it's safe to say your brother's a goner, especially if Lady Emphysema goes missing too. Speaking of which, things aren't looking good for her. Does no one else see the walls opening up and shit? Might want to let someone know you're seeing things so they don't just park you in a dark corner with your fellow invalids and head out to happy hour like that. And cue the freak show. I suppose it's only appropriate she get murked by Weez and Ed. The good news is, this thing body modded itself into blindness. Once it walks by, we should make for those windows across the hallway and take a nosedive onto the concrete below. What, were you expecting me to say we should pick up our oxygen tank and try to put up a fight? Take a look around. We're standing at the threshold of hell. Better to just get it over with now and spare ourselves whatever unimaginable suffering Pinhead and company have in store for us. However, despite knowing full and well this is where she gets off, Serena decides she'd rather make a break for it and go out gasping for breath like a fresh caught salmon. Do you see how it suddenly went from day to night in a matter of seconds? I'm no meteorologist, but I'd say that's probably a bad sign. Eventually the sidewalk ends and she finds herself getting pinched by a trio of freaks on their way to impart a little otherworldly advice. <laughs> That's actually a dope one-liner. I guess that's what she gets for sacrificing all those innocent jellos to a gang of Eldritch abominations. Evidently, news of her death traveled fast, as it's already gotten back to Riley and Trevor. But does that dissuade her from carrying on with her little self-delete mission? Of course not. In fact, she's ready to double down. Since leaving the hospice, she's been researching Roland Voigt, who Serena name-dropped before getting sliced. According to the interwebs, Voigt was connected to a wide range of shady dealings, including the disappearance of as many as four nobodies, all before vanishing without a trace. The way she sees it, this can't be a coincidence, so she decides to head on down to his derelict estate to search for clues by herself. Yeah, or alternatively, why don't we just drop this thing down the nearest storm sewer and harness the guilt we have from indirectly causing our brother's death to turn our life around? Nah, sounds difficult. Better to just recklessly piss away our future trying to change the past. Riley arrives the mansion to find the whole thing encased in a latticework of iron bars. However, there's just enough space between them for her to squeeze her way through an open window. After wandering aimlessly through the maze-like corridors of the monument to excess, she eventually finds a study practically wallpapered with hand-drawn renderings of the same strange figure she saw back at the kitty park. On the desk, she finds a notebook containing Voigt's detailed notes of his interactions with the so-called Cenobites. Sometime later, Riley's broken from her trance-like review of all things cubicle by what seems to be her brother's voice calling out to her from a distance. No sh it looks like it might really be him, in the flesh, or what's left of it, anyway. Shuddering away from the vanishing meat sculpture, Riley suddenly finds herself in the arms of her friends, having been led there by Trevor after getting worried. The gang tells her it's time to come home, but Riley won't budge. Instead, she asks for some privacy so she can share her findings with Colin. Exposition incoming. So, based on her research, there's six total configurations the box can be in, and we're currently sitting at the third. Whoever possesses it at number six will be granted an audience with some kind of puzzle deity, wherein they will be granted one of six fabulous prizes. Life, knowledge, love, sensation, power, resurrection. Man, all those gifts are lame. You want life? Go touch grass. Love, tinder. Sensation, tinder again. Power, you got guns and pre-workout. Resurrection, well, okay, you got me on that one. I guess, in that case, it sounds like we just need to feed this thing three more jig to get her brother back, so we'd better get to stabbing. Hmm, I wonder if back page is still a thing. Meanwhile, Trevor and Nora are back upstairs raiding the liquor cabinet and flipping random switches on one of the do-everything panels located behind the bar. It's a little strange this place still has electricity despite supposedly being uninhabited for more than six years. I mean, sure, Voight's estate can probably afford to keep the lights on, but what's the point? Kinda makes you wonder if it's really empty, doesn't it? Suddenly, Nora accidentally opens a secret passageway in one of the nearby walls. Inviting, isn't it? Good thing she's smart enough to not walk blindly into the pitch black tunnel by herself without telling anyone. I'm just kidding. We all know she's going in there. And now she's locked in. Awesome. All right, no reason to panic just yet. We've got our phone light and the switch to open the door is right outside where our friends can access it. Unless it was actually activated from somewhere else, in which case we're probably about to be brutally murdered and stuffed full of straw, straight up corn style. For now, we should just put her back to the no 
zone exit and keep an eye on the tunnel while pounding on the wall like her life depends on it, because it probably does. Fortunately, Trevor hears her cries for help and comes to the rescue. Well, sort of. Have you considered, say, flipping all the switches all at once, instead of just randomly hunting and pecking whichever one looks good? Then again, what's the point of having a secret door if any idiot could spam their way inside? It probably requires a specific order or combination of switches. Whatever it is, better hurry up before Noah blows a forehead vein. Hey, it's not our fault if you couldn't help but entomb yourself the first chance you got. Seriously, how stupid do you have to be to go splunking in Luigi's mansion all by yourself? It's almost as bad as leaving your soul-sucking murder cube unattended while frantically spelling out your Charlie Day conspiracy theory. And now, this is gonna happen. Have you found it? Ah! I mean, now we only need two more, so it's not all bad. Lucky for Nora, it was just a stab and go. Not that it's gonna make any difference here in a minute, but at least she'll have the comfort of seeing her friends one last time before being brutally skinned alive. As for our secret stabber, bad move letting her get away like that. Not only did you lose the cube, but now the others are going to know for sure that they're not alone in here. I mean, it's not like she could have done that to herself. Although, we're not exactly dealing with a bunch of rocket surgeons here. Hearing her screams, the rest of the gang makes for the rotunda where they find her petrified on the floor with the devil's box sticking straight out of her back. The good news is the blade is still inside her. We just need to pack clothing or something around the wound and have someone support the box while we rush her to the hospital. The last thing we want to do is pull it out and open up the floodgates. I'm, I'm gonna pull it off. Okay, just go. I'm gonna try to uh, fly bridge. Jesus, dude. Even Riley knows better than that. Are we all really competing for the title of biggest fuck up in the group right now? Because God knows it's gotta be neck and neck. They hauled Nora back to the mystery machine and make for the main gate. But wouldn't you know it, Mr. Voigt had this place built like a mate. Gee, I wonder why. While everyone takes turns screaming directions over one another instead of monitoring their friend's rapidly deteriorating condition, things take a turn for the worse. It seems even being in a moving vehicle won't stop the torture team from siphoning you off into the under verse for a little pinhead Pilates. The fleeting visage of Nora being flayed alive distracts Trevor long enough for him to high center the van on part of the landscaping. Well, if there was still any doubt in anyone's mind that this thing was for real, I'd say that pretty much settles it. Only now, in this late hour, does Riley realize she's in over her head. While Colin and Trevor argue over the surest path to self-destruction, she grabs the fun box and runs over to a nearby bridge to end this nightmare before anyone else gets the hooks. But just as she's about to cast the one ring into the fire, a whisper from beyond stops her cold. Your brother's ending was exquisite. Two more and he is yours. Notice how she didn't say anything about Matt being alive when you see him again. Besides, if stuff like this is what they call exquisite, then their idea of comfort probably makes the one chip challenge look like a pie eating contest. Riley tells the Ceno bitch where to shove it, but it turns out she has an ace up her sleeve. With a flick of her wrist, she completes the next configuration remotely, driving the blade into the palm of Riley's hand. However, instead of immediately whisking her way to the Twilight Zone for her violent dissolution, G.I. Jane says she can save her own life by finding someone else to take her place. Well, that's just great. Probably should have let go of the rhombus of terror before shooting her off or down like that. All the more reason we should have found the lunchbox to put this thing in instead of just lugging it around with our bare hands the whole time. I guess the only thing left to do now is figure out who's up for some acupuncture. Then again, nothing says we can only go after our friends. I mean, we kind of have a golden ticket here. Think about it. Now's our chance to rid the world of literally anyone we want without consequence. After all, Freaks Incorporate will take care of the body at no extra charge. Personally, I'd go for the sick SOB that nailed her friend back in the mansion. It's only fair, although that place is built like a funhouse. And while she didn't specify how much time we had to fulfill our end of the bargain, the less time we can spend with that hanging over our heads, the better. Hold on, wait, can we step her with it? She is standing right in front of us, after all. Hmm, nah, she'd probably thank us for it. Oh, well, better start thinking of a number between 1 and 10. Hey, perfect timing. Here come Trevor and Colin now. Hold out your hands, boys. I've got a surprise for you. However, before Riley can bravely sacrifice another person to accomplish her goals, the Cenobites come back and force to collect. And this time, they brought their secret weapon. Yeah, never mind the fact that you can manifest chain 
things from nowhere to rip people limb from limb. What you really need is a set of wind-up chatter chompers on legs to slowly shuffle in their general direction. That'll put the fear of God into them. Thing doesn't even have eyes. How is this any worse than being chased by a normal person who is also trying to bite you? Well, I guess it's just the most terrifying thing ever, as Cullen seems to have suddenly forgotten how to walk. Come on, dude, get back on your feet. Nibbles is gonna be here any day now. Oh, I see what's going on here. My glasses! I can't see without my glasses! Turns out it's totally fine because Pac-Man just blows right past him like he's not even there. Probably because of all the racket Riley and Trevor are making over at the fence. Wait, why are you two trying to hold the gate closed? You can easily outrun this thing forever. Who the hell cares if it gets through? Evidently, they both have roadkill reaction times as it somehow manages to pin them behind the gate, crushing Trevor's ankle in the process. Well, at least the freak can't reach us through the bars. Oh, but don't let that stop you from stiff-arming Chatterbox right in the face so he can take a chunk out of your bicep. Genius. Fortunately, Riley's got something else for it to chew on. It's about time she does something useful. Now we know it works both ways, and it's even moved things along to the next configuration, meaning we just have one more to go before we get our wish. Time to bust out our special puzzle skills to get the knife ready in case they send any other slow-moving antagonist to minorly inconvenience us. Although that last one really did a number on Trevor. Better have Cullen buddy carry him back to the mansion solo while we run ahead and scream at them to hurry. What? It's called management, okay? Back in the house, Riley finds the magic switch to close the shutter sealing off the front door. Okay, that ought to keep the freak parade at bay, but Trevor's not looking so hot. Oh god, here comes another belt tourniquet. When will people learn? How about we start with just a balled up shirt pressed tightly over the wound? Tourniquets, especially poorly improvised ones, are meant to be a last resort for when you already know nothing else will work. Besides, we have no idea how long we're going to be trapped in here. By the time we get him proper medical care, his arm could look like Butler's from Scary Movie 2. On another note, remember how Nora got straight up murdered by an unknown actor prowling around the house earlier? Well, apparently, Riley and Cullen don't, because they just left their unconscious friend completely unsupervised while they screw around with a pain box in the other room. What are you worried about, waking him up? I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to let someone who's just lost a ton of blood fall asleep, much less gobble up a bunch of painkillers. Whatever, at least they have the knife ready to go for their next confrontation with the creepers. Speaking of which, it seems Freddy knows just how they might be able to catch one. After popping Trevor up against the control panel, Riley instructs him to open the gate so she can lure one back into the antechamber for its cootie shot. You know, cause they'll never expect us to try the same thing twice. Not sure why she wouldn't trust her life to the perfectly healthy dude instead of the pilled out casualty that could nod off at any second, but whatever. Once outside, she calls on the baddies to come and get her, and they oblige, deploying yet another one of their elite operatives to make the takedown. Jesus Christ, it's worse than the last one. Hey, far be it from me to question the motives of sadomasochistic demons from another dimension, but maybe your minions would be more effective if you actually let them see what they're supposed to attack. Plus, just look at this shambling mess. It's even slower than Chomper. Well, looks like we got another slam dunk on our hands, boys. Wait, why are you backing away from it like that? Just walk up and poke this thing so we can go home. For real, what are you afraid of? The first one immediately backed away and took it on the chin the second he touched the blade. Why would this one go any different? Oh, that's right. We still need to open our big fat mouth so that it hears us and goes totally f***ing bonkers. Seriously, why on earth would you feel the need to say, careful, right before she did the deed? You complete and utter moron. Although it shouldn't even be a problem since we could easily just hold out the knife and let the freak impale itself. It's not like it'll see it coming. Luckily, Trevor manages to shut the gates just in time to trap old Wheezy on the opposite side of the room, but not before Riley could force a fumble on herself by running headfirst into a stationary object. Great going. You lost the one and only thing we can use to end this nightmare. Okay, all right. We're not hosed yet. I'm sure Colin will be able to find it laying around here somewhere. That is, unless someone else finds it first. Oh, shit! <laughs> no! Hey, look who's back. And just in time to join the idiot contest. Tell me, why would you stab the frail little geek that posed literally no threat to you instead of, oh, I don't know, that half-baked scorn cosplay that will for sure tear your ass? 
shreds the second it finds a way out of there. Now, not only is there a ticking time bomb ready to blow the second someone hits the wrong switch, you also just made an enemy of the only other people in here that might have been willing to work with you towards mutual gain. I mean, sure, they could potentially piece the whole Nora thing together, but I'm pretty sure they've already completely forgotten about that. Well, in any case, with Colin on the ground, we finally reach the requisite number of kills to complete the final configuration, Leviathan. And the developments don't stop there. Much to Riley's horror, it turns out Trevor was on Void's payroll from the very beginning. It seems this entire ordeal was all part of his plan to force a do-over with the Cenobites after they fitted him with that lovely little nerve wracker six years ago. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me it took you, a billionaire, half a dozen years to kill five random strangers of your own choosing? Hmm. Then again, I guess you did opt for the gift of sensation from a bunch of freaks that looked like this. What were you expecting? The goddamn tickle belt? Voight orders his flunky to open the exterior gates so the death cult can come to the negotiation table. However, this also creates an opportunity for Colin to make a run for it. Not that that's actually made a difference for anyone else this far. Either way, the ringleader thinks it's super important that he be tortured to death with an earshot for some reason, so he sends Trevor hobbling after him to do what exactly? Dude's in no shape to be restraining anyone right now. Besides, this is the one thing these Hellions actually know how to handle. He won't make it far. With his doorman indisposed, Void takes over the controls and seals the gate just as the pinhead priestess crosses the threshold, trapping her in the entry room. He then proceeds to tell her all about the one-star Yelp review he plans to write if she doesn't take this thing off him pronto, and he wants her manager to know he won't be letting her leave until she does. Just then, Riley takes advantage of the dialogue to slip underneath the Cenobite trapped in the doorway and swipe the puzzle box from its pedestal before arriving at the control panel. Right as Voight realizes his mistake, she flips the switch for the door and turns this little hostage negotiation into a funeral. The priestess explains that there's no returns at the mull of the damned, only exchanges. But Voight's desperate enough to take whatever he can get. Anything is better than this. Bro, take one look at this chick and tell me it couldn't possibly get any worse. This is exactly how you wound up in this mess in the first place. The management approves Void's trade-in request and removes the device as promised. However, no sooner than the gaping hole in his chest miraculously heals, a massive hook from above immediately takes its place and drags him screaming off to the big box in the sky. Meanwhile, down in the basement, Lady Rainfly is really giving Colin the business with the bailing wire. But before she can finish the job, Riley homes in on the screaming and comes in for the save. Hey, Trevor, you might want to start limping your ass out of there, because if there's anything we've learned about these things, it's that they aren't all that picky about who's at the end of the hook. Give it to me! <laughs> Yeah, or just go ahead and pull it straight towards your abdomen. Literally, all you had to do was not be standing around watching Colin get mutilated, and there would have been absolutely nothing she could have done. With the substitution complete, Wonder Woman cuts Colin loose in favor of the latest offering. And this time around, she doesn't waste even a second warming up for the main event. Told you you could have pulled better, man. Especially since she could have just as easily gone for the monstrosity pulling the strings. Of course, after the shit he pulled, you gotta believe she was itching for some consequence-free revenge. Having saved her last remaining friend, Riley returns to the surface to find the Cenobites assembled in the main hall. It turns out they think it's pretty cool she went above and beyond and wasted someone with a final configuration, so they've decided to grant her a prize of her choosing from the six potential gifts they have to offer. And boy, did they really try to sell her on the resurrection, even giving her a little glimpse of Matt looking all sullen with his hands out, like he wouldn't come back as one of those slow blind things should she decide to go that route. Fortunately, she now has the clarity to see their offerings for the complete ripoff they truly are, and opts to receive nothing. Only, it seems that's not an option. Then you have chosen a life of regret. Your suffering has barely begun. Oh yeah, I'm sure little survivor's guilt is so much worse than having Satan's sewing machine shoved through your chest for all eternity. Upon receiving her prognosis, Riley looks down to find the cube has returned to its original shape, and with that, the ghouls have vanished without a trace. However, instead of tossing it down the nearest mine shaft where it can never hurt anyone again, she stays true to her selfless nature and places it on the floor for some unsuspecting liquidator to find, and probably bring home to their kids. In the end, only Riley and Cullen made it out alive. However, had they taken our advice early on and ditched the puzzle box the second they realized it was a disappearing machine, we could have definitely kept Nora alive, and even Trevor, despite him being a backstabbing piece of sh 
we also had a pretty solid opportunity to wrap things up before Voight showed up at the end, and I'm sure Colin really would have appreciated that. When it's all said and done, I think Hellraiser was beaten. Moral of the story, what doesn't kill you will probably make you wish it had.